Well, we're here at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. And Lainey Brown, hi. Oh, I just want to say thank you for coordinating and curating this My conversation. Pleasure. We're so excited <laughs> about it. And Kalia Dorsey has joined us. Hi, Kalia. Hi. Good to see you. Great to see and you. And Harriet Mullen, what a total honor and pleasure <laughs> that you've joined us for this conversation. Happy to be here. Yeah, this thank is very you. exciting. Welcome. This is a spot Welcome. that you like. What is this spot exactly? This is the Mildred Matthias Botanical Garden on the campus of UCLA, where I sometimes bring my creative writing students to write poetry. Here they write Tonka in this garden. That is very cool. And we've chosen this spot, even though urban tumbleweed Tonkas were written all around. Yes. The west side in particular, I imagine, but also in Topanga and some other places. And some were written right here in this and place. And right here. While my students were wandering around collecting their sensory information, I was sitting there writing my own tanka. Yes. And some of them got into the book. So, yes, there's one about a squirrel. That one's in the book. And, uh, and then also when I traveled, you know, when I went to Colorado or Ohio or Pennsylvania or Maryland or Sweden, some of those got in there, too. Uh, those are in there, too. There's some that were written during a week in Stockholm. Yeah. Well, we're really excited about this conversation. We're, we've picked out 18 of these, and we're never going to get to all 18. Right. So I thought what we'd do is start with Lainey, pick one of the, the ones we've chosen, pick one, and then the four of us will just riff for a little bit about what happens in that one. And then when, we, when we're ready to move on, I'll ask Kalia to pick one. And then Harriet can pick one, and uh, let's go from there. Okay, Lainey, pick one. Great. <clears throat> I'm going to pick on page five, the one beginning chain link fence. I wonder if you would read it, and then maybe Harriet, if you don't mind, Harriet, read it. Okay. And then, then we'll just start. Maybe Lainey will say why she picked it. Okay. All right, you first, Lainey. Chain link fence, locked gate, protect this urban garden. Fugitive fragrance of honeysuckle escapes to tempt the passing stranger. Did I read it? Yes. Yes, please. Chain link fence, locked gate, protect this urban garden. Fugitive fragrance of honeysuckle escapes to tempt the passing stranger. Love that one. Lainey, say one thing that helps us understand why you picked it. Fugitive fragrance. Fragrance how could that be possessed? I feel like it's pushing against this idea of property. Mm. Kalia, what do you think? One thing makes you think of? Um, I guess I'm interested in the idea of temptation um, in terms of, I know that these were written mostly when you're going on walks. And so thinking of how mobility is agency, but it also um, is sometimes a temptation and also something that you're being kept from and so there is still limitations even if you're mobile in the world. Mm. This happens to be my favorite uh, <laughs> of certainly of the ones that we've chosen and I'll say why because I you know being an academic trained in grad school studying the Renaissance I was always told the garden is a prison and a haven at the same time. The garden is protected but it's also open I think this one really gets at that whole question of are we locking something in are we tempting people to come inside so Harry what do you think how, how are we doing so far yeah well the original Garden of Eden was a place of deliberate temptation deliberate abundance uh, supposedly free but not exactly completely totally free I mean free will means you can do the wrong thing and get in trouble right. so the idea I mean this is literally on my walk from work to home and um, you know the honeysuckle beckons and then there's the chain link fence that means you don't come in here mm. you can smell it but you can't come in how about protect because we have a double subject, therefore we have protect rather than protects. Mm -hmm. Chain link fence and lock gate, protect. Mm -hmm. Protect from what? Yes. From the casual stranger. Somebody might trample it or yes. to disrespect it. Yes, which does happen. I mean, you may notice that our students, have, or some visitors, I won't blame our students, 
carving their initials into the bamboo in this garden, which I always tell my students, please don't do that. Write your poem in your journal, not on the bamboo. And fugitive, that's a, such a powerful word here. The fragrance is fugitive because it's escaping through. It's running away from the prison haven. Yeah. So, and escapes. So the passing stranger who could mess things up by trampling it or carving initials, mm -hmm. also is, there's a positive possibility there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's escaping toward the stranger who's passing by, mm. tempting the stranger or beckoning the stranger or at least allowing the stranger to enjoy some aspect of that mm. garden because it can't all be held in. Mm. The fragrance escapes through the chain link fence. Mm. You can't come in, but you can smell it anyway. Mm. At some point, one of us is going to just say, what are the social and maybe even political or urban politics implications of a situation like this? But maybe we shouldn't get there quite yet. <laughs> so, Kalia, pick, a, pick one that you find remarkable or a favorite or... Um, I like the, on page 10, the bottom one. Would, not gonna would you it. read it and then Harriet, are you still okay reading it sure, the yes. second time? Okay. If you must keep a dog in the city, <laughs> you've got to go out for walks. If you must stop at my house, please pick up your pooch's poop. Why do you like that one? Um, because I have a puppy who I'm obsessed with and I take her on like two hour long walks every day and that got me into the practice of um trying to get my twelve thousand steps a day um as a way to kind of make healthy my relationship with my body and exercise and so I was intrigued in like your practice of walking in general and what that how that informs how you write your poetry but also how you perceive your body in the world and in your poems. Mm -hmm. Do you want okay. to read it Harry? I'll read then... it. If you must keep a dog in the city you've got to go out for walks. If you must stop at my house <laughs> please pick up your pooch's poop. So this is a very urban poem because people who live in a rural area they don't have to walk their domestic animals. You know, they walk themselves. Mm -hmm. And we find people living in cities, sometimes in very small, confined spaces, but they will have a pet because they want the companionship. And also they want an excuse, you know, a reason to walk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they greet their neighbors and so forth. And, you know, in my neighborhood, there are many signs. I don't have this sign in my yard. Maybe I should, but my neighbors have pick up your dog's poop, mm. you know, or an icon that says no dog pooping. You know, sometimes it's a picture of a dog pooping with a... Right, mm -hmm. right, I know that one. Yeah, <laughs> yes. But people <laughs> don't really, up. people who are going to let that happen, the sign doesn't make a difference. Right, probably. yes. Communication But, you know, also down. that poop washes into our water source. Yeah. You know, it goes down the gutter into the ocean, and that ocean is recycled back into our water. So... That's what we're polluting, our own source spoken, of... <laughs> spoken someone who knows Los Angeles really well. <laughs> Laney, what, what happens here? This is, this is comic, one of those tanka that's comic, but then it hits you zip, zap. I'm noticing how you stress the word must when you are <laughs> reading, and it, I feel it, it's calling into question what's public space and what's private space, and what are the boundaries, what are the responsibilities of a person moving through public space and what happens when they, nobody takes that responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's a disaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Harriet, you want to pick a, one that among these 18 that really speaks to you today? Right. Let me be sure I'm getting one from the handout then. I think maybe it was Native or Not. Oh, that's a powerful one. Mm -hmm. Where was it? Which page? That's 21. Page 21. Okay. Native or not, you're welcome in our gardens. Lavender's dress is not so vibrant as your green trousers <laughs> and purple velour sleeves. Fantastic. Mm. Why'd you pick that one? LA is full of people who are not native to LA or California or the United States. I'm not native to LA or California. Uh, many of us are transplants like the 
plants growing in this garden. This garden has plants from all over the world. LA has people from all over the world. Um, LA has a tradition of ethnic minorities working in the gardens of wealthier people. Uh, it was Japanese Americans for a time, and now it's mostly Latino people. Uh, I think at some point it has also been African Americans. In the South it would be African Americans. And um, so the idea that some people own property and some people were property and some people work on the property owned by others. Um, just literally, you know, if I want to just spill all my business, <laughs> there is a plant called Mexican sage that has a beautiful velour texture to the flower. Oh, wow. And it's similar to lavender, but it has that fluffy velour mm. surface that lavender doesn't have. Mm. So I was comparing the sage and the lavender. Wow, that makes your, the, the second your, Y-O-U-R second line, doubly powerful. It's personification, but there also are people in the garden tending to these plants, right? Right. And who kind of dress, in this case, one imagines the person visiting the garden, working or visiting, is dressed to be with, to be aligned with this <laughs> plant that you are admiring or that you typically would admire. Mm -hmm. And this is a play on native and non-native plants mm -hmm. and so on. It just, this, this, this one really keeps on going. <laughs> Lainey, say something about it, please. I love what you had to say, Harriet, and I'm the play on non-native as person or plant. Mm -hmm. I just I love how that works in multiple ways in the piece, and it just raises so many questions about belonging and human intelligence versus plant intelligence. Mm -hmm. Kalia, what are your thoughts? Um, I think often in poetry, it's like nature is this irreplaceable, you can't mimic it, you can't come close to the beauty of nature. And I think like the green trousers and the purple velour sleeves and the not so vibrant um, makes us think twice about what it means to take what you're given and make something different out of it rather than try to mimic it. That's really cool. So for the, for the brief moment, according to the speaker, Lavender's dress is not as vibrant as this person who's actually kind of almost not out naturalizing but one up naturalizing and actually adds to the scene of is lavender native? I think that lavender, usually I hear it called either French or English, mm -hmm. and a Mexican sage is native to this part of right. the country. So you're playing with who's native? Yeah, who's native? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, where, where, how far back in history do you want to go? <laughs> yeah. And that's what we say about gardens as well, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. after, how, how old is this garden? 80 years, 100 maybe? Uh, probably. Right. Mm -hmm. So after a while, we have to just say, this thing has kind of always been here, but of course that's not the case. Laney, the social, sociality element of this thing, the power of the word our, which the speaker and or Harriet, fully aware of the danger mm -hmm. of our, mm -hmm. our gardens. You can come into our gardens. You want to say something about that? It's, it's a question of who gets to decide, who gets to make these decisions about what's native and what's not native, and how long it takes to become a native if you're not a native. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to pick a favorite one. Is it my turn? Yes. I think it is, right? Okay. <laughs> Page 20, the middle one, about the legality of taking someone's avocado. <laughs> I'll read it, and maybe Harriet would be willing to read it. Yes, it is legal to harvest the overhanging fruit of your neighbor's avocado tree. Just don't smuggle it out of state. <laughs> yes, it is legal to harvest the overhanging fruit of your neighbor's avocado tree. Just don't smuggle it out of state. 
And that is true. You, you're not supposed to take avocados out because they could spread diseases. But not because you've stolen it from your neighbor. No. They're not going to say at the airport, <clears throat> it's okay to leave the state with this avocado, but was it your neighbor's? <laughs> right. That's, that, so you're mixing the illegalities. Yes. Here. Right, right. Because it is, it is literally legal to harvest overhanging fruit. If it overhangs on your property, you can harvest it. And why is it illegal to take an avocado out of California? Is it because California, is it a business thing? You can't take uh, citrus fruits, avocado, there are a lot of fruits that you'll be stopped at the border. Is it bugs and diseases? Bugs or and is it diseases, economic? yes. It's yes. not economic. And especially the seed of the avocado mm -hmm. carries uh, mm -hmm. some kind of pathogen, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But the bugs and diseases don't affect your neighbor? The like the I mean, state? the neighbor might have bugs and diseases, but as long as you leave it in California, you're okay. Do people, you're both LA people, mm -hmm. and you're kind of on and off in LA, no? Okay, <laughs> all right. But do people take avocados and lemons and things from their neighbor's tree? Of yeah, people course. take them to their relatives who don't have avocados or yeah. citrus growing in their backyard. As a kind of custom, like a sharing thing, a communality? I think this used to be done. I mean, now it's not done because they will stop you if they catch you. This is happening in Texas, too. You know, they're trying to take eggs from Mexico into mm -hmm. Texas. Uh, but it's the same thing with avocados. I think in Texas you can take the seed out and bring the avocado in, but then it's going to turn brown right away. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's about controlling pathogens and, and um, pests from over borders. So it's about patrolling a border, you know, so that your neighbor's, the artificial border your neighbor's the fence is a border, right. and then there's the border between this state and right. another state, and this right. country and another country, all right. of those boundaries. We're right. talking right. about mm -hmm. boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But the plants don't have the boundaries that humans have. Yeah. The, the, the avocado is like gold. It's so amazing, mm -hmm. and it grows here. And it doesn't, it has an abundance to reach out to the next house. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care that that's where the fence is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas this is humans a major point care. Of this There's an work. organization here called Fallen, it's called Fallen Fruit, mm -hmm. and they collect uh, the fruit that's in sort of like the median of the mm -hmm. road or, you know, the, that overhangs the street. Mm -hmm. And it's legal for them to harvest that and then they give it to food banks. Mm -hmm. So we have been joined by Will Alexander. What a great honor, Will, it is that you're joining us. Thank you. Thank you this guys is really exciting. And Will doesn't know this, but mm -hmm. yesterday, and of course anybody watching this video years from now is not going to care that it was yesterday, but <laughs> yesterday in real time, we were on the beach feeling oceanic, and we read and talked at length with the video camera about two of the poems, the cosmic oceanic poems from your new book. Divine Blue Light, okay. which we love. And we're very, yeah. we're overwhelmed and thrilled by that conversation. So we are honored that you're here to talk about Harriet's poems. Thank you. So where, thank you. So where we left off is Harriet's going to read the Topanga poem, and then Lainey's going to tell us why she picked it. Okay. Okay. Hiking up Topanga Canyon Trail, we spoke of bobcats, coyotes, and rattlesnakes, but only harmless lizards crossed our path. Lainey, why'd you pick that? Because none of these animals are actually dangerous. We are the dangers to them. I love it. That was succinct. Succinct. I, I <laughs> am myself. I'll go next. Ma, and then maybe Will. I am a few days from now meeting some friends who've lived in Topanga Canyon forever. And we are going to hike. I wish I could remember right now the name of this mountain hill. We are going to hike run up there on this crazy path. I am a big fan of Topanga Canyon. It is very different from the lushness of what we have here. And I just want to say that the key phrase for me is, I wrote it down, I already outlined it, spoke of. Because mm. I think, Harriet, that's kind of a reference to the act of writing these things down. Spoke of is sort of a cousin to, well, my imagination is bobcats and coyotes and rattlesnakes. But what gets into the poem is what was really crossing the path, which is this, these, these little lizards. <laughs> and poems can do that. They can kind of get to the edge of danger. It's sort of Emily Dickinsonian for a moment. It's like, I can imagine all this crazy shit, but in the end, just lizards. 
<laughs> How far off was I? It's part of the lore of the trail that you think, oh, we might see a bobcat. You know, Ooh. there might be a rattlesnake. And once there was a rattlesnake on the road, actually. <laughs> do you do that hike a lot? With, with friends. Yeah. I don't do it alone. Yeah, it's pretty right. fantastic. Will, what do you think of when you see this poem? I'm thinking that you're apps. I concur with you. Thank you. Absolutely I'm right. Honored. But the, uh, the, the lizards and the bobcats and the rattlesnakes are all seemingly concurring in the imagination that of danger, always danger, not of nature. Yeah, yeah. So we have to understand how things can be understood in their own environment rather than keeping them mm. askew and uh, out, of, out of reach. I love that. Yeah. Fantastic. Kalia, your thought, and then we'll go to another poem. Um, I agree with Lainey. It's just like the idea of this harmless um, and how we think about what's dangerous and what's harmful without ever putting ourselves in the equation. Mm. Cool. And interesting for that to happen, I think we've already said this, in a poem we know was written by a person who wrote it and has a speaker who is probably not a bobcat or a coyote, is probably a person. <laughs> and, and we can prove biographically that, in fact, it was a person. Okay, who wants to do... Kalia, do you have one that you want to pick for this round? Um, yes, on four, the middle one. Yep. Oh, this is great. Do I read it? You want to read it and then Harriet will read it? Sure. Awakened too early on Saturday morning by the song of a mockingbird, imitating my clock radio alarm. <laughs> Harriet, okay. will you read that? Awakened too early on Saturday morning by the song of a mockingbird imitating my clock radio alarm. Kalia, why'd you pick that and then we'll turn to Will? I picked it. It was in line with the one we spoke about before in terms of like nature and imitating nature, but it also made me think of the newer generation, which I may or may not be included in, where we confuse the reproduct we pro we confuse kind of like the remix and the remastered and the sampled for the original because we don't know the history so we don't know how far back things go mm -hmm. um, and so it's sometimes not from a disrespectful place but just that idea of what's um, imitated to one might have an original and that everything is kind of a reiteration of something else so Harriet Mullen the person who wrote this <laughs> is not in that generation. What do you think, and Harriet's right here, so this is really cool. What do you think Harriet, or the speaker of this poem, would say about your generation thinking, well, it's either a ra it's either the mockingbird doing the alarm or a mockingbird, a bird itself, it doesn't matter, I'm getting up. <laughs> what do you think she would say about your generation's confusion of reality and the imitation? Um, and mechanical imitation. I don't exactly read the poem as a critique, but I think it might be read that way, um, kind of just in a facetious way of um, how can a mockingbird imitate the radio alarm, which is an imitation of the, like when you read the um, alarm sounds on your phone, there's one that is probably mockingbird. Um. <laughs> so do you think maybe Harriet Mullen is just wagging her finger a little bit about the confusion? Yeah, I think it's I just guess an before observation. We turn, before we turn to Will, we can, we can ask the source. What do you think? Are you a little disappointed that that confusion could happen? No, I mean, I think, please read into the poem anything you want to read into the poem that, you know, the text will justify. And I think it could justify that. I mean, this was literally, I don't set my alarm on the weekend. You made a mistake. No, I mean, the mockingbird sounded exactly like my alarm. <laughs> and so even though I planned to sleep through the morning, mm. I was awakened by this bird that has been listening to my clock the whole week <laughs> and is now imitating my clock. But, yes. of course, the alarm <laughs> clock is a stand-in for the rooster or whatever. Right. You know, the cock crows at dawn. So we have this mechanical thing to wake us up that used to be a bird. Hmm. And now this bird is literally, I mean, in, literally was imitating beep, 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 beep. That's what I heard from the, and I'm looking around like, my clock, I didn't set the clock. The clock's not, it's the bird outside. You are awesome. I mean, you're saying so much about nature and us and I'm like, wow. Yeah, but also we, we do have, you know, black poets were called mockingbird poets because we don't say imitating. anything original. 
we just imitate Europeans, right? Right. right. That's what they called right. Paul Lawrence Dunbar and his whole generation. Right. They were called mockingbird poets. Or, or even Claude McKay when he decided to do a sonnet, yes. he, he couldn't get out of that because. And you're using Tonka, so you're really aware. Uh, oh, I'm aware that I'm not the tradition. Wow, there's so much in that poem. We'll riff on this one, please. Well, Harriet said it most succinctly. This is not a mockingbird understanding that an understanding that has been protracted and implanted within us, uh, upon us, but it goes back to Phyllis Wheatley and Thomas Jefferson's take on Phyllis Wheatley, that how could she write such work? Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to go into this whole idea of originality. Don't need picket fences, brick wall, or razor wire our homes protected by prickly pear cactus and thorny bougainvillea. Now, this whole idea of nature coming in and African Americans, Africans being part of this original nature that's trying to be suppressed, poetry included, it's a radical move to bring poetry into this, this innate, ornate intelligence. Mm that has been compressed and distilled with such an array of vitality. So in that poem, which is on page 21, mm -hmm. security, as in keeping bad out, is natural. It's the prickly pear, rather mm -hmm. than all the fences and walls and razor wires, which are all, Harriet, all in this book. All those walls and fences are all over the book. But here, our home, do you want to say a little more about that? That was great, Will. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, these are, as far as I know, other than the bougainvillea, which I think is not native, but the cactus, the prickly pear, those are native. Uh, they, they, the plants grow these spines to protect themselves, right? Mm -hmm. But also because they are protective, little animals will nest in the vicinity of these things because they're being protected by predators, mm -hmm. from predators. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and literally many be Angelinos have these things around their homes as, right. as part of their fencing. And I think it is partly security, you know. So you could buy a fence, you can plant a fence. You know, but we're, we're using nature as a fence, you know, uh, to defend us from other natural things, including human beings. So, I mean, just to me, the layers of uh, defense that we require to live what we think of as a civilized life mm -hmm. is always kind of amazing to me. And, um, and, and usually in, in Los Angeles, you will have the built fence and the plant fence, mm -hmm. you know, together. Mm -hmm. One reinforces the other. You have it in this book, this amazing book, that prison haven duality of gardens that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you haven't tried to solve that problem. Some of the poems see the garden or the enclosure, the natural enclosure as a haven. Some see it as something we use to block others out. You're not trying to solve that thing. It's you want observation. It to be mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, who's, I think it's, well, Will just picked one. So mm -hmm. let's, is it Lainey, your turn? I don't know, but I do have something to say about that one. Okay, just please, and maybe another, Harriet will get one. Another get layer to what Harriet was just saying that I think is so interesting, this question, what are we protecting? Mm -hmm. So if people are making all the security, they're, they're fearful. But the plant that makes the thorns, the uh, prickly pear cactus, is protecting the water inside. Mm -hmm. The water is a valuable resource and the humans are just squandering the water and you know making this security but the plant knows something else that we all need to survive that's so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Harry, you want to pick one? Uh, Alaska? Okay, how about this one? Why should I care about my neighbor's riotous <laughs> dandelions? <laughs> Does he concern himself with my slovenly jacaranda? What are you saying to your neighbor <laughs> through this poem? And did you slip a copy of this poem through the mail slot? No, no. Well, <laughs> this poem, I mean, this poem is not very serious. But, you know, 
there is the phenomenon of homeowners wanting to invest in the value of their property, maintain their property. And I, I think probably in my block, I am known as the one who's not keeping up the standards of the neighborhood. But in this poem, Harriet, it's the neighbor who has right. vandalized. The so you've reversed that problem. Right. But you're not the type I'm who's going to go and my say, tree, you right. know. But nobody's going to say the house value has declined because the jacaranda is sloven. Oh, yes, some of them do. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, yes. They will complain. You know, they'll let you know. I try to think of the neighbor as either a person of color or not a person of color. And either way, I feel like there's this theme of policing and respectability politics um, where certain people are wanted in certain neighborhoods and certain people are kept out. And when you break that class barrier, the respectability and the upkeep and the aesthetic um, difference is always going to be, I guess, kind of mm. held against you. Mm -hmm. Harriet, is the first question a so-called rhetorical question, like, why should I care? I actually should care. Is it possible to read it that way? The thing about dandelions is that they spread, you know, because of those little seeds that float like parachutes. Yeah. So people are concerned about dandelions because if you have them, then I'll have them next, right? Yeah. yeah. If you care about that, you know, none of us should have lawns by now anyway, right? We because. should have gotten rid of our lawns yeah. because of, of the water that they waste. Yeah. But pe some people do still have lawns and care about how they look, and you don't want dandelions. And then you don't want your neighbor's, you know, slovenly tree, you know, because uh, those little beautiful purple flowers are sticky and messy on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. They stick to your shoes and you tramp them indoors. So, I mean, this is all about how do things look, you know, how things look determines the value of the property and the schools that your children can attend and the services at the city, the amenities of the city that are provided. I mean, all of that is connected to how things look, yeah. what's allowed in and what is excluded and who is excluded. Yeah. So these are obviously among the big themes of this book. Harriet's got a copy of the book itself, which I hope that will hold. Can you hold that yeah, steady for the camera? Urban Tumbleweed, you have to get it. And our team is going to each just say a final thought about what's happening overall in this book. We'll let Harriet be last and say um, what, something we haven't talked about yet. So who's ready for a final thought? Lainey, are you ready? Sure. I'm still thinking about the last one that we read with the dandelions and the jacarandas and about how again and again there's this ignoring the natural resources in favor of how things look, how a lawn should look when in fact dandelions are this nutritious food and this powerful healing herb and yet humans can't wait to get rid of it. So the plant intelligence I feel is really strong the more than human intelligence in this book and I really love, love that. Love it. Thank you. Kalia Dorsey, final thought? Um, my final thought is thank you for including me um, <laughs> on this. This is really Such fun. Pleasure. Um, but also, on page 10, one that we didn't get to um, pedestrians on neighborhood sidewalks swerving slightly to avoid smearing a child's exuberant drawings in colored chalk. Oh, um, nice. I think that just embodied what this collection was to me, just a way of enjoying my morning walk more um, and keeping it playful, but also being aware of how I'm interacting with mm. nature. You did exactly what I imagine the poet hoped we would do after reading this, which is to walk <laughs> in the city and see things. Will Alexander, final thought? Well, I'm thinking that Harriet has telescope language to such a crystalline, to, to crystalline degree that all of these topics are palpable. Mm. And we're able to discuss them. And mm. she takes the whole history of the situation of urban poetics and transmutes it yeah. into a, a kind of a crystallizing, I'll call it a crystallizing stardust. <laughs> oh, I love that. And that's an Alexandrine phrase, the stardust <laughs> part. <laughs> you got your aesthetic in there. Yeah. Um, my final thought, 
I am an urban gardener uh, in Philadelphia, a tiny little thing. I plant it intensively. I spend much more money. It's not flowers so much, Harriet, as vegetables, but I spend much more money on the plants and the work and the effort than I do the yield of saving the tomatoes that I would have bought at the supermarket. But to me, it's very important. And your bird of paradise thing, which, you know, I've been, I'm at a hotel while we're staying here, and every hotel has a bunch of bird, bird of paradise plants mm -hmm. in front. We call it birds of paradise, plural? I don't know. Bird of paradises. And there's the potted plant in the florist shop window. But here in my yard, it grows with no help from me which to me is exactly what it's about, the balance between cultivation and intensity of human intervention and of things riotously doing what they do without, that they would do without us. That combination is what the city is all about, what living in the city is all about, and I just, I'm, I'm totally in love with this attitude. Harriet, you get the final thought, the final, final thought. Well, the whole book to me was exploring how I d nature is part of who we are because we do so many things to separate ourselves from nature or to exploit, dominate, and, um, you know, use nature for our own purposes. And to think about how we are part of the natural world, we depend on it. It doesn't depend on us. We depend on it. Uh, but we are a part of it. And to just have a daily practice of walking, observing, paying attention to that interaction between us and the rest of nature, not us here, nature over there, but we are part of this bigger web of nature. Thank you so much, Kalia. Thank you. Thank you. Laney, Will, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Harriet Mullen, we're honored thank to you. be talking about your poems. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.